I'm Nicholas Bornovius, president of Capital Inc., and I am delighted that I have the opportunity to welcome uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Martin Stockford. Uh, Martin is so well known and respected uh, uh, in the global maritime industry, uh, and we are sincerely privileged to, to have him uh, with us. Uh, Martin uh, has agreed to share his insight on uh, a very uh, interesting and critical topic for the industry, technology and shipping, smart shipping. And uh, again, uh, thank you, Martin, for being with us. Uh, I am turning the floor over to you. Uh, and thank you very much. Nicholas, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I, I just love the background of uh, Shanghai. It makes me feel as though I'm with you there. Of course you aren't there, but this is virtual, uh, virtual conferencing, isn't it? Um, I, uh, uh, Nicholas, um, talking to the audience now, hi guys. Um, the, Nicholas offered me a choice of topic. And what I chose was, uh, as a title, was how smart is smart shipping as an investment because i thought you guys are um are in the investment business and i've noticed recently that a lot of investors are feeling a little bit uncomfortable about uh, investing in new ships and I, I think that they are very right to feel this way and so what i want to do is spend just 15 or 20 minutes running through some of the issues which have um come into my mind and interestingly quite by coincidence it is uh, 15 years it's five years to the day since i did my um Anassis prize lecture on smart shipping and so i pulled out the slides and had a look at them and uh, i find that the principle I, I think i understand that the detail a lot better than i did then and i that's helped me to reach some more specific conclusions about what you ought to do and these are the things that I want to share with you in my slides. So if I can just get started now, um, we, can, uh, uh, we can get going. And so uh, how smart is smart shipping as an investment? Well, I, uh, I want to uh, cover four points here, uh, but before I do that, let me just explain uh, this rather uh, elegant ship to you. This is, um, this is the Savannah, which was a nuclear ship built in the late 1950s in the United States. And uh, it was a cargo liner and a beautiful, as you see, a very lovely ship, a futuristic design with a nuclear, two nuclear reactors in the back here. And it was 9,900 deadweight cargo liner. And the, um, the point that I really want to make by showing you this is that as a ship, it worked extremely well. It was safe. It was reliable. Um, but unfortunately, uh, if you went to buy a 9,500 ton cargo ship from a, a shipyard, it would cost you about $0.65 million, whereas the, um, the Savannah cost $43 million. And it was the price tag. That put it out of the business and that really is um, a point that I want to make about right at the beginning about autonomous ships. Um, we know we can build an autonomous ship just like we know we can build um, a nuclear cargo liner what but really we're not in the business of you know sort of putting a man on the moon we're in the business of moving cargo better and I think this is where the correct fo focus is smart shipping for, for general purpose uh, cargo distribution is smart shipping not um, autonomy and so uh, the um, I want to cover basically four points with you this this afternoon um, first of all marine technology needs new solutions I, I think that what is driving as towards the, um, the smart shipping philosophy is the fact that the, uh, the technology is not really adding very much to the industry nowadays. We've, we've used up the data, the, the bank of what we had already available. The second point is that digital technology 
will lead to a better business model. It can lead to a business, better business model. And so we're looking, the, the, the cupboard isn't empty, there is something in there. The third point is that smart shipping is about organization, not about ships. And that's really where I would like to focus. We all love to talk about ships and it's very easy to talk about the technology on the ships, but really when we talk about digital technology, we're talking about organizing um, the people who are really smart and the smart component in a modern shipping company is not going to be the digital technology on the ship it's going to be the teams that operate those ships and so that's my my, my sort of lineup and I, let me start right away with the um the need for new solutions the the, the Maritime industry in this has been around for a long time. This chart shows you um, the way freight rates have developed since 1750, believe it or not. And you see at the end of the sailing ship era, the freight rates were going up. They were short of technology, same as today. You know, the ships were they're great ships. They're getting a bit bigger, but they were not really much better. Then along came the Industrial Revolution, steamships and um, the and we had liners and tramps uh, which were bigger ships more um, and they were able to substantially reduce their costs and you see how the freight rates went steadily down until the end of the 1920s and then we got a little bit of interregnum in the recession and the second world war and we come to the 1950s when there was another revolution uh, and shipbuilders learned how to build very big ships and uh, much more cheaply. And the specialization replaced the, the liners and tramps, which were small, highly flexible ships. And today, since the 1980s, we have seen for the first time in 150 years, the trend has not been going down. It, uh, remained pretty static in the 90s and it's been going up since then and so that basically is my evidence to say that the shipping industry is looking for something new to add to its product portfolio in order to make it a better business and smart shipping can do that let's uh, go to my second point which is just to give you the nuts and bolts of smart shipping um, in fact Digital technology and networks is not new. It's, it's in the shipping industry started working, believe it or not, with digital networks back in the 1850s when the first cables were laid across the Atlantic. And this was a truly uh, a networking experience. I, I mean, I, I know one of the things that really impressed me about the smart technology was when Uber would, uh, you could order your cab in the restaurant, you're sitting in the restaurant, you order your cab to take you home after dinner. And um, with Uber, it arrives immediately, whereas previously you had to order the cab half an hour ahead of time so the guy could drive from your local cab rank and pick you up. Um, and the, in fact, Uber had something that the cab driver, the other cab drivers didn't have. It knew there was a cab sitting right outside your door. And, you know, the shipping industry was doing that 150 years ago. I mean, Clarkson's 150 years ago was like a sort of 19th century Uber. Their, their super brokers would have an owner with a ship that they needed to um, a cargo for. Um, the ship would be sitting in the middle of nowhere with no cargo in sight. The Clarkson broker would head down to the Baltic Exchange and very soon he'd meet an agent with a cargo somewhere near to the, 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 the loading, uh, in the viable loading points. They'd negotiate the deal, uh, shake on it, and the broker would rush back to the office and uh, send a telegram instructing the master of the ship to pick up the cargo. And you'd you really have a, a real network operation driven by people and in, interestingly just as evidence of how important that was in 1874 i think uh, clarkson spent more money on uh, telegrams than it did on wages believe it or not but then i mean <laughs> i think probably brokers didn't earn as much in those days i don't know anyway 
Um, but back to the, the key point, that it doesn't get bogged down. Um, digital technology um, had took another step forward um, in the 1970s and 80s as we started to get satellite communications. We'd had radio, but satellite communications made uh, it possible for ships to communicate a bit better, but it was still fairly clunky. Um, and in the mid 60s, mainframe computers appeared. Um, as you can see, this is the CDC 6600, the first supercomputer, had a clock speed of 10 megahertz and uh, 980k of memory, believe it or not, it cost $7 million. Um, but it, I mean, I actually wrote my first computer program on this particular model, not in 1965, but a little bit later. Um, and that, this whole process just expanded through as integrated circuit boards got cheaper and cheaper and smaller and smaller. So that we got mobile uh, laptops, we got smartphones, and now we have microprocessors. This, uh, and these microprocessors, uh, microcontrollers, are not are complete computers effectively. They have input output, they have processors, they have storage, they have memory, and um, they are actually this particular microcontroller, uh, which is a rather fancy one, uh, is more considerably more powerful than this computer. Um, but it costs, uh, I believe it costs about a dollar. I think this is perhaps a little bit more than a dollar, but those are the sort of prices that you're into. And suddenly um, you can pop these microcontrollers into anything. And that means that the internet of things became possible. You put one of these chips into your coffee pot and you can call it on the way home and tell it to start making coffee, which it does. It's not, it's not smart enough to, go to the cupboard and get the coffee out if you've got to put it in, but it's pretty good. And the same sort of process followed on in industry, uh, very much the same time, the, the I4 revolution, um, which is the technology revolution in industry, where you start to put these, uh, these microprocessors into um, equipment in factories and you do jobs that were previously done manually and you control processes much more uh, fastidiously and of course this was a terrific thing because it may, meant that quality systems started to work because in order to sort of automate uh, these processes with uh, microcontrollers uh, you had to actually define them very precisely and that's exactly uh, and correct any errors and so that's exactly the way that you can build uh, quality assurance systems by putting additional uh, bits and pieces into the algorithms running these these processes and we are now approaching the stage where shipping can do this thanks to the satellites and we've got um, first of all um, i4 devices here which um, include the satellites of course the cheap microcontrollers, smart sensors, which um, don't just um, send information, they process it, they make it more relevant, they tell other people, other bits of the ship about it, smart actuators which switch machines on and off, but they also do lots of other things like check that the machine isn't jammed, look for power spikes, that sort of thing, uh, and artificial intelligence which strings them together and does whole processes very efficiently. These are, the, these are the things, the hardware of the system, and but these bits and pieces need to communicate. They need networks. And you need, um, you, to have networks, you need unique identifiers. Ideally, you have protocols, you have smart apps, voice and touch interfaces. These are all things that you need to do effectively in order to make the whole uh, process work smoothly. And, these are going to be very challenging. May I can't disguise that fact. It's not going to, it's not going to happen overnight. But it, one way or the other, just like containerization, it will happen. It was painful, but it will happen eventually. And what we're talking about is I4 on ships. And what we're going to do is bring the ships together with the people and make the whole thing work properly. Just a final little note on this one. To, uh, I mean, 
one of the reasons why I'm a big believer in this is the, the way the satellite um, uh, network is expanding. I mean, this is one of MRSAT slides. At the moment, they've got uh, four of these geostationary satellites in place, which are massively more effective and more productive than their predecessors. They, they can focus the beams and do all sorts of clever stuff. But look what they've got ahead of them. Uh, there's a whole string of satellites coming in in the next two or three years. And so Ronald Speter, the um, president of Imarsat, says he says each of these new satellites is more powerful than all the previous ones they've been putting up. It's just escalating and they have lots of clever features. So I think, you know, you need to do your own homework. But I think that, you know, communication is changing. And this brings me on to my third key point, which is smart shipping is about organization, not ships. Um, we love ships dearly, but business is about organizing things. And this is where smart shipping will be if we follow what land transport industries have already done. We start off with using assets more efficiently. And so the first thing is that we integrate functional systems to in improve QA, maintenance and performance. If you do those things, I mean, I worked in industry for a long time and it, um, it really makes a massive difference when, you, when your QA systems click, click into place, suddenly the world changes and your costs go down in ways that you'd never dreamt was possible. Uh, secondly, you manage shipshore personnel into a single more productive team. They don't hate each other. They're actually part of the same team. You know, they, they, if one wins, they all win. Um, that is a, a big step, but it's possible when they can all talk to each other any time, just like we're talking to each other digitally now, or at least actually this is, a, this is a monologue, isn't it? So I wish I could talk to you. The third step is develop control networks to cut costs and improve management systems. The car industry did this. You replace wires, masses of wires, the more of these bits of kit, these little controls you put on the ship, the more wires there would be. So you don't control by, you don't communicate by wires, you communicate by a central control network along which you send messages. And you can put as many messages as you like. It gives you enormous flexibility to do things that you couldn't do before. And you at the same time generate a ton of information which you use to find ways to improve performance and reduce accidents. And also the information informs teams on how their business is performing and really I mean that's what makes life fun is when you actually know that what you did yesterday really works. The second step is you produce regulatory information digitally through um, onboard uh, diagnosis systems and this this just reverses the whole process instead of complaining to the IMO about all the information they want, you actually deluge them with information and um, there's a good chance they might come up with better, much better regulations because they've got something to look at, you know. And finally, we develop wide area networks to support through transport systems and um, the sorts of things that we've, the container industry has been trying to do for years, we bring to everyone together. Well, um, just one very little example of how this can help you financially because it's numbers in the end. This is actually from the, the, the presentation I gave five years ago, but it's an interesting little example. I didn't have a, another one to hand. It's a truck fleet and it's an analysis done by GE Capital Solutions. And um, the, on this truck, the, they analyzed 124 truck jobs and they cost 61 thousand dollars that was a total cost to do the 124 jobs by resequencing the routes they got that down 18 percent to fifty thousand dollars by reassigning deliveries they got that down to 20 to forty four thousand dollars of 28 percent saving and by reducing a few routes they got it down to 30 percent so they saved 30 percent on that just by you know, looking at the data of what they're doing and finding there was a better way. I mean, these are one-off one things, but 
they nevertheless reoccur every time you go to business. So finally, back to the team issue. Um, they really are the smart part. It's people that are the smart part of this whole process and they need to work together um, on the ships. The people on the ships can communicate. We have the, the cloud, we have company systems, we have the ship teams who are constantly uh, communicating with the people in the office, the shore teams who are managing the business and the systems uh, analysts who are supporting the whole thing and making sure that the technology is constantly improving. You could, this is stuff that you don't do it all once and then sit back. Every day you're busy improving it. And uh, of course you need the technical teams to who, who talk the language of the people on the ships. And so the whole thing is one big happy family, we hope. Uh, well, that's the be the day. Eh? <laughs> and um, we have our stakeholder networks. The cargo owners are part of this whole business because they're part of the information chain. And the ports for through transport and the shipbuilders and equipment suppliers. This is great stuff. So conclusion, smart shipping's a team game, not a solo, solo marathon. Look for, in your investments, look for strategy, leadership, and a team who can put the digital board in the net again and again and again and again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Martin, thank you very much for, again, delivering a tremendous presentation. Your insight is unique. So thank you very much. This has been a, a great uh, introduction to um, our, our second day and uh, to the theme of technology and smart shipping. Thank you again for being with us today. Nicholas, thank you so much for having me along. I've really enjoyed it and have a great conference. Thank you.